Hello, everyone. Welcome. Another beautiful day. See, we only have beautiful days on Fridays. Now, I'd love to introduce our speaker. Dr. Brooklyn is board certified in addiction medicine and family medicine. He has worked for the Community Health Centers of Vermont in Burlington since 1993. He's been on faculty at the UVM College of Medicine since 1992 and currently is associate clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Psychiatry. He is the medical director of the Howard Center Chittenden Cl Clinic and the Baymark St. Albans Clinic. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. John Brooklyn. I think this is the first in-person thing I've done since COVID, so my voice is a little rusty, and I'm already starting feedback. Um, so I have MD after my name. I don't have any other initials after there, so if you're asking me questions that are unrelated to anything medical, I'm probably not going to be able to answer it very well. My hope today is to kind of cover three topics. One is... Um, how opiates work in the human brain, uh, the history of opiate use in Vermont, and then our treatment network and what has been going on for the last 10, 15 years. So that's my format. The first question I have is who is here because they wanted to learn something new? Who is here because they don't want to learn anything new? <laughs> no, serious, seriously. So your desire to learn something new is based on your desire for novelty, right? You want to have something new happen because our brains are hardwired for novelty. Who has only one purse? <laughs> Who has only one pair of shoes? Because we like, to, we like novelty. So the reason that this is important is that when you think about the reason why people do things, we're often motivated by a reward. We have a system in our brain set up to reward us. So when we do something that is pleasurable, we squirt out this chemical called dopamine. Anybody hear that before? Dopamine? Okay, dopamine is the currency of pleasure. It also is involved with our memory and our muscle activity. So there's lots of uses for dopamine, but in, in my context, it is that when we do something pleasurable that rewards us, we release dopamine. So we also have a system in our body where we release certain chemicals that resemble drugs in the world. So we have a chemical called an endorphin. It is our own opium. We make that. We make a chemical that resembles cannabis in our brain. We have a drug that resembles benzodiazepines, which are prescribed by doctors. So we have these substances, and an ethnobotanist would say to you that probably 100,000 years ago, we started to consume these things, and our body began to produce them. This is important because if you begin to do something that is pleasurable, you sometimes release endorphins, you release internal opium. You also release it in, um, in the context of pain, pleasure, and once you release an endorphin, you release dopamine. So the system is kind of designed where if you do something, have an activity, you take a substance, and it makes you feel good, you're probably going to do it again. And I bet in this audience, 10% of you have brains that are hardwired where if you do some kind of a substance, you really like it, you're going to do it over and over again because that's kind of the, the percentage. Now maybe none of you, maybe none of that 10% are here. They're at home on Zoom doing something else. Maybe they're online shopping while they're listening. I don't know. But you know, the fact remains, this is kind of how it all works. There are those of us here that have um, different receptors in the brain so that when you consume a substance, it lights your brain up and you really like it. There are others for whom they can take a substance, whether it be alcohol, tobacco, uh, opiates, that you use it, you take it, and you have no interest whatsoever. It might even put you to sleep. So depending on how you're hardwired, puts you at increased risk for opioids. So if you're sitting here thinking, why are some people opiate users and some people not? It's because of the way that all humans are wired some have a higher proportion of receptors that really like opiates, and some don't, and there's a whole lot in the middle. So the 
issue around opiate use is ancient. Humans, probably 10,000 years or so, there are uh, evidence of exposure to opium. And opium typically comes from Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, that part of the world, the Indus Valley is where it was first discovered. So humans have been using opium for thousands and thousands of years. Does anybody know when the first synthetic opiate was produced? Any idea what year that might have been? Let's take a vote. Anybody think it was in the 1800s? Anybody think it was in the 1700s? Anybody think it was in the 1600s? Anybody think it was in the 1900s? Anybody think it happened last week? <laughs> I mean, I'm not getting much from y'all. So in reality, opium, in fact, has anybody ever read the book Confessions of an Opium Eater? Yeah, so this was, this was a book about um, uh, someone in England who wrote a story about his love for opium. And the first third of the book was how pleasurable it was, and the second two-thirds of the book was how miserable. We'll talk about why that is in a minute. But in reality, um, morphine was the first drug synthesized by chemists, and that was somewhere between 1830, 1840, 1850, just in time for the Crimean and the US Civil War, so that if you were injured on the battlefield, you could suddenly be given a pharmaceutical drug via a syringe, via injection. Up until that time, in all of humanity, if you had an illness and you had pain, you weren't going to get any pharmaceutical. But doctors in the Middle Ages were actually known for their prowess in preparing opium for consumption by humans. And there was a famous uh, apothecarist, um, Seidenheim, in 1610, said something like, of all the things you know, in God's world, the most efficacious and wonderful is, is opium. Because if you were ill, you had pain, if you had dysentery, if you were giving birth, any of those things, you could be given opium. And opium, when taken, was either, uh, was either made into a mixture, usually with wine and spices and things of that sort. But it had to be either consumed orally or uh, smoked. And so when suddenly a drug was designed that could be given um, uh, via syringe intravenously, uh, it suddenly changed the complexity of opiate use in humans. Because when you take opium um, or various forms by mouth, it gets absorbed into our body slowly. It has to go through our bloodstream. It has to go to our brain. It takes a while. But when you inject it, it suddenly gets there pretty quickly. So the whole concept of opiates and the human brain is such that only in the last 200, 200 plus years have humans really been exposed to pharmaceuticals. And then after morphine was uh, developed uh, and the Civil War and the Crimean War, there were people who were given these drugs who became physically dependent on these drugs because in the human body, the receptors, and the receptors are kind of like little TV antennas that are sitting on top of the roof, and a drug will attach itself into that receptor. Um, the morphine kind of resembles the endorphin that we have, and it sits itself in the receptor. And what it basically does is it turns down the volume of stress noise. Um, anybody have a stressful event ever? <laughs> so what happens? What do we do in our body? What, what chemical do we release? Adrenaline, right, epinephrine. And so these cells that have opiate receptors on them are cells that produce adrenaline. So if you get stressed out or you have pain and you're given an opiate, you suddenly reduce the amount of adrenaline and you become calm. In some cases, you become sleepy. So when humans begin to take a substance other than the one that we produce, like a pharmaceutical, like morphine, um, it really turns down the noise, and it turns it down really well. And the more you take it, because the cell wants to be releasing adrenaline, because the person's stressed out a lot or has a lot of pain, um, the cell doesn't like that, because it wants to be making more adrenaline. So you have to take suddenly more and more morphine to get the same effect, and that's called tolerance. So when anybody takes opiates for a period of time, it can be as short as a week you can develop physical tolerance, meaning that if you suddenly take the drug away, uh, you develop symptoms of what we call opiate withdrawal. And really, opiate withdrawal has three components. The receptors in the brain that the opiates go to, that controls our blood pressure, our heart rate, 
Uh, it controls our mood, but we also have opiate receptors in the gut. Anybody, if they were younger, took kaopectate as a kid or whatever, that was actually a tincture of opium. It slows down the motility of the gut. And then we have receptors in the spinal cord. So usually in people that are having pain when we give them opiates, we're trying to cut off the signal from the broken leg or the broken arm that goes from the spinal cord to the brain saying, this really hurts, trying to cut that off so you don't feel it. The pain generator is still there. It's just we're cutting it off so you don't feel it. So when people go through withdrawal, the opposite happens. The pain comes back, bowels get loose, they might vomit, they're going to have uh, achiness, they're going to have chills, their blood pressure, their heart rate's going to go up, they're going to get very anxious because of all that adrenaline. It's really like an adrenaline rush. And can you imagine having that happen? You probably don't, wouldn't like that to happen. So people even who go to a doctor and get prescribed opiates, if suddenly you run out, I don't know if this has happened to anybody, after being on it for a period of time, you will be sick. You'll be sick with what we call opiate withdrawal. So the physiologic things that happen in our body, the tolerance and the withdrawal happens to anybody who's been on opioids for a, a week or longer, okay? So you have this new drug that's been developed in human in humanity, and you begin to give it to people, especially people who've been injured on the battlefield during a civil war. They didn't have very good surgery back then. So people suddenly became, were given morphine continuously and became physically dependent on it. They got it every day, they got it. And so when the war was over, there were a lot of people who developed problems with morphine. And so what happened is um, there was really no law regulating the use of morphine, and so a lot of people continued to get it and take it. Now, where does it come from, right? So most of the opium that is used to make morphine would come from Turkey or would come from, you know, that part of the world, uh, Middle East and the, and the Far East, and it was um, shipped to the United States and made or used in Germany. But at the same time that this was going on, there was also um, the opium wars that were occurring in um, between Britain and um, China because China did not had a lot of tea and the, Britain, the Brits like to drink tea and so what would happen is that they in many ways got tea from China but China had to buy opium in response to that so the, the country of China developed this huge problem with opiates and opiates in the late 1880s, 1890s, they had these opium wars where most of the wealth at that time in the world was generated either by silver or by opium. There was a tremendous amount of opium trade in the world. You probably didn't know that, didn't think about that. But because of all the opium that was available, patent medicines began to package um, opium into their different elixirs. So let's say, you know, you had hurt yourself and you hurt your arm on the farm and you went to the drugstore, the apothecary, the general store. They would have these bottles of patent medicine that would have all kinds of stuff in it. Uh, and you could buy that and you could take it. And so there were a lot of people that began to take these patent medicines and become physically dependent. So in essence, taking opiates all the time can be problematic for people. However, let's compare opiates to other drugs. Who thinks that taking opiates over time does damage to the organs of the body? Let's have a show of hands. What organs do you think get affected by taking opiates? What? Your brain, how does it affect it though? Does it cause damage? So in, in reality, opiates are relatively harmless when it comes to doing hard damage. They're not going to rot your liver. They're not going to affect your kidneys. They're going to make your heart blow up. But you take alcohol, on the other hand, when we consume alcohol, we break it down into a compound like bombing fluid, acetaldehyde. So anyone that consumes alcohol gets exposed to a toxin, and it can affect your heart and your liver and your kidneys and your brain and your nerves. Um, smoking tobacco certainly can affect your lungs, your heart can do damage. But opiates as a drug are actually pretty benign in the sense of not causing damage. All the consequences of using opiates, that's a different story. People can overdose if they take too much, they can develop all kinds of social troubles, but opium as a class of medicines is relatively safe when monitored. So in the Vermont, in the um, 
18, 1830s, 1840s, we were considered the breadbasket of Vermont, right? We raised a lot of barley and wheat and corn and oats. And what happened is that surplus grain often went into these little stovetop homemade stills of farmers who would start to produce their own grain alcohol. In fact, I don't know how many of you are Vermonters, but if you go back to the early days of town meeting, in the early days of town meeting, town meeting was often an accounting of how many barrels of rum, cider, beer, whiskey did we have for the year as a community because there was often a necessary amount because you know Vermonters like to drink and they like to have be enterprising. And so if you look at records from jails in the 1830s and 1840s, the amount of public drunkenness that was occurring was crazy. And so at one point Vermont almost became the first state in the country to have prohibition. In 1855, 1860, they tried to pass these dram laws whereby if you were a, a tavern owner, and you gave someone too much alcohol and there was some kind of accident, you would be liable for that. It didn't pass, but it became very close. And so when opium came on the scene, it suddenly became an alternative to alcohol because you could consume a little bit of an elixir of opium and not pass out, not get hurt. You're, you became functional because you became tolerant to it over time. So there was a shift in Vermont around 1860 from a lot of alcohol consumption to a fair amount of opiate consumption. And that continued all the way up until 1890, uh, 1900. In fact, there was so much opium that was consumed, different forms in Vermont, that there used to be bales of opium straw in Boston Harbor waiting to be shipped to Vermont for conversion. And so that Massachusetts and New Hampshire passed laws to keep all the opiates made here in Vermont from going to the other states. You used to be able to go into a general store and getting a slice of cheddar cheese, you could also get a slice of, of opium. So it was very common. And so we had a very robust opium uh, use in our state to the point that um, there was an organization in Enosburg Falls called the Spavin Company. Who knows about the Spavin Company? One? One person. S-P-A-V-I-N. So the Spavin Company produced the Green Mountain Tonic. Now what do you think was in the good old Green Mountain Tonic? It was not maple syrup, okay? Which probably would have been a good choice. It was alcohol and morphine. And they packaged this. They were one of the largest producers in the country of a patent medicine. They became wealthy beyond belief in Enosburg. And the building is still there. And in fact, there were two guys from St. Albans who, who put up a little display at the U Mall for a little while about all these old opium artifacts and manufacturers. Anybody, did anybody ever see that? I think it's still there. Anyway, they had a little museum of what was going on at the Spavin Institute. But the point is that Vermonters really took to opium back in the day, in the 1880s, 1890s. And so when we talk about the problem today, you have to reflect back that it's not necessarily a new problem. I contend, having been here since 1975, that Vermonters really do like opiates. We have uh, traditionally been um, consumers of them to the point that in uh, in the U.S. Congress in 1908, there was a representative, Foster, there was there, our one U.S. representative, who tried to pass a national ban on opiate use because of what he saw happening in Vermont. And what was happening, it was being prescribed for everything. You could, there was no law, again, on prescribing opiates. So you could go to a doctor. You could go to a general store, you could go to a druggist, you could go to apothecary, and any of these folks could give you opium in various forms. So there's zero regulations. And in fact, there was a, a Dr. Grinnell in Burlington that sent a survey out to all the different entities that were prescribing or, or selling uh, morphine in 1905, and I think he determined that there was enough for five grams of, of opium every day, enough was produced in Vermont for every Vermonter, every Vermonter, to have five grams of opium a day. So that's not very much, but go home, get your scale out, and throw some coffee beans or some sugar on the scale, five grams, and imagine that that's opium. 
Okay? And there was enough for every Vermonter. Now, obviously, every Vermonter didn't use it, so there were a whole lot of people doing a lot, of, a number of people doing a lot of it, some people doing some of it, and some people doing none of it. So there was this large consumption. So when we talk about the problem in Vermont, we know that uh, the historically there's been a lot of consumption of opioids over, this, over the centuries in reality. However, in 1911, the U.S. government passed a law called the Harrison Act. And what the Harrison Act did is it made it suddenly illegal for any doctor in the United States to prescribe any opiate product to anybody who they thought was addicted to it. So if you suddenly put a door down and you say, you who used to go to your corner druggist and you'd pick up morphine or whatever you'd pick up to use, suddenly you cannot get that prescribed to you anymore. And oh, by the way, anybody know what the Bayer Corporation makes? Bayer? Aspirin. What else did they make that was really well, really well known? Heroin. So they developed heroin as a cure for morphine in 1880s. They thought this is going to be the cure-all because what they did is the enterprising chemists of the Bayer Corporation figured out how to make aspirin from willow bark. They also figured out how to, if they added this compound to the morphine, it would cure morphine addiction and people wouldn't use it anymore. The problem with heroin, we'll talk about that in a minute, is that it's a terrible way to take it orally. But if you were to inject heroin, it gets to your brain in about 10 seconds and causes this tremendous amount of euphoria. So very quickly, the drug for which the original intention was to relieve people of morphine addiction became a drug of abuse such that in the turn of the century, as you remember, you could buy your hypodermic needles in Sears and Roebuck. You could, from the catalog, you could get your own needle kit, syringe, needle, a little a case. And so it was very common for people to have a way of injecting opium uh, morphine, heroin on their own, it was completely legal until 1910, 1911, when suddenly this law was passed. The other part of that law, in addition to treating uh, uh, anybody who had an opiate addiction, was that if you were uh, a doctor, you actually couldn't talk about or, or train future doctors in opiate addiction because it was now in a, sort of an illegal activity. So from 1911, on until probably the 1960s, 1970s in the United States, there was absolutely, if you were an opium user and you had an addiction problem, you couldn't get prescribed by a physician. So for a long time, there was a sort of a chilling effect on the amount of opiates that were prescribed. However, as time marches on, somebody asked a question about the pharmaceutical company. So the pharmaceutical company, you know, Bayer was a pharmaceutical company, the producer of morphine was, developed these other opiates that they thought might work better than, than morphine. Because some people take morphine, it makes you sick, it makes you uh, have a bad reaction. And so other compounds such as oxycodone, anybody ever hear that? Yeah. Hydrocodone, anybody hear that? Hydromorphone, um, oxymorphone. Those drugs were developed as alternatives to morphine for pain because you could take them orally. And to be fair, most people who were given oral opiates to take don't develop a problem with them. They take them for a short period of time, they had a surgery, they had an injury, they take them for a short period of time, and then they stop and they're fine. But there's a subsegment that do not. So when you have these oral medications that are useful, they can be helpful. Methadone was also an oral medication that was developed in Germany in the 1930s when the Germans were kind of battling out with the Turks and they couldn't get opium, so they developed methadone. That was also an opiate. And in the United States, because a lot of people who were heroin users or morphine users couldn't get treatment, they continued to use, they were considered criminals. They were often put in jail. They were often, uh, you know, suffered a lot of uh, difficulty. Um, there was an attempt by the U.S. government to set up these treatment centers for people that were heroin users or morphine users. And there was a place in Fort Worth, Texas, and a place in Lexington, Kentucky, where you went to a farm. And I think that's where the term go to dry out came from, because people would go there and they would be given morphine or they would be given methadone to try to help them not be sick and perhaps wean off of the opiates that they were taking. Because if you're opiate dependent, if you're physically dependent on opiates, you stop immediately, you get sick. But if you slowly reduce the amount you're taking over time, kind of a wean as we call it, you oftentimes, sometimes, maybe can come off of opiates. 
Oftentimes you can't because when you start injecting heroin, mainly, what happens is it goes to your brain very quickly. It goes to that receptor that we talked about early on. It bounces onto the receptor. You feel the euphoria for a little bit, the high, and then it wears off. But because it doesn't last long, if you do it over and over again over the course of the day, you initially feel euphoria, but then eventually you're just trying to keep yourself from being sick. You keep using heroin all the time. It changes those cells in the brain that make adrenaline, in some cases permanently. It changes the electrical activity of the cell so that if you don't have something occupying there, you develop a, this chronic sense of feeling sick, feeling withdrawal, feeling anxious, constant adrenaline rush. And so most people who become dependent on heroin or dependent on using drugs intravenously, they develop a chronic brain disorder so that if they don't have something there, they continuously turn to use. So those of us who are in the room, who are not shopping right now, who are not you know, skydiving right now for our dopamine, we may not understand what it's like for someone to have this intense craving all the time because their brains have changed to the point where they are not going back to the way that things were. It's like taking a balloon, blowing it up, and expecting it to be this tiny thing again. It's usually kind of swollen for the rest of its day. And so people who become physically dependent especially on heroin, have oftentimes a lifelong need for treatment because they've changed the way that their brain works. They haven't damaged the brain, they've changed the way that the chemical structure, the chemical reaction in the brain works, so if they don't have something there, all the meditating in the world, all the going to rehab in the world, all the going to meetings in the world, often doesn't change the nature of someone who's a heroin user. And so you have in the United States, you know, in the early 60s and 70s, there were estimated to be about a million daily heroin users in the United States. And obviously, if you're using a needle, people can share a needle, they can get sick, they can get hepatitis. This was before HIV. So that our federal government decided that they wanted to start some treatment. And there were a couple researchers in uh, um, New York, Rockefeller University, who began to study the use of methadone. Because as I mentioned, methadone's an opioid, but it's a long-acting one. So if you take it once a day, it gets into your brain, it stays in your brain all day, it doesn't bounce off, and people could suddenly start to feel well. So they found out that if they gave heroin users methadone, they stabilized and they would stop using heroin. They would go on to lead happy, productive, healthy, safe lives, stop committing crimes, stop getting sick. And so the government in the early 70s decided that they would sanction the use of methadone as a treatment for opiate use disorder. It became the first treatment in the world that was, it was, for, for, uh, the US was not the first country to do it, but it was determined to be a reasonable treatment. So there were a lot of restrictions on it. And so in terms of the treatment network, methadone had to be dispensed from a licensed opioid treatment program and you had to get a, a federal license and you had to have a state license. In the United States, New York, California established these clinics in the 1970s. Uh, how many of you are from South Burlington? How many of you remember when Vermont had its first methadone clinic? Raise your hand. Not very many. So in Vermont, in the 1990s, when I moved here from Rhode Island after getting my training, and I was trained in how to treat opiate use disorder. I, was, uh, I started working at the UVM Substance Abuse Treatment Center. We were studying an alternative drug, but there was no treatment in the state of Vermont in the 1990s for opiate use disorder. While it had been sanctioned in the US since the 1970s, and it was primarily because Governor Dean, Howard Dean, gotta love the guy, he was a doctor who in New York experienced people who'd gone to a methadone clinic and he didn't like them. So because he didn't like them, he didn't want treatment in Vermont. He didn't want methadone treatment in Vermont. So for about 10 years, we used to run a bus in Vermont from either the Northeast Kingdom or Burlington down to Massachusetts or New Hampshire where people would go to clinics out of state, get their dose of methadone every day, and then turn around in th three hours back. So it was a six hour ride, start at like three or four in the morning. So if you wanted to hold a job, what were you gonna do? Like six hours just to get a dose of methadone that costs about 50 cents. Right? So we spent a tremendous amount of money sending people out of state because of political uh, opposition to it.
there was some very bold um, uh, state officials and state legislature legislators that finally decided it was time to have treatment and they pushed hard and on the day that the civil union bill in Vermont was signed in 2000 Howard Dean signed the bill authorizing the first methadone clinic in the state we were still one of eight states in the US that didn't have treatment so 42 other states had methadone treatment in the US we didn't have it so we established the first clinic over at the University Health Center and uh, on the UVM campus and that was the first methadone clinic and so we brought people who were traveling into the clinic and it began to grow at the same time in 2002 there was an alternative medication called buprenorphine or some people know it as suboxone which is an alternative to methadone and we were researching it at UVM for about 10 years it was found to be very very effective for treating heroin users and so that also came online about 2002. So in 2002, we had both methadone and buprenorphine suddenly arriving on the scene in Vermont. Vermont's second most rural state. People have to travel a long distance. And so there was only one clinic in Vermont. It was in uh, Burlington. Um, the legislature uh, limited it to only 100 people. Um, there was a pretty good drug problem in the state at that time. HIV had started to be a problem in the late 80s, early 90s, and yet we had no treatment for that. Um, and so in 2002, we embarked upon getting doctors trained in how to prescribe buprenorphine because you had to go to the clinic for methadone, but you could go to a doctor's office and get a prescription for buprenorphine suboxone and go to the pharmacy and fill it. So I ask all of you, if any of you had opiate use disorder and you needed treatment, would you rather stand in line at a clinic waiting for your dose, or would you rather go to the doctor, get a prescription, and go to the pharmacy? Who'd like to stand in line? <laughs> right, but you had to do that. That was the federal guideline, and so the alternative was this buprenorphine. So very quickly in Vermont, 2002, 2003, we trained a lot of doctors on how to prescribe it. We had knowledge on how to prescribe it because of our research, and Vermont in 2004 became per capita had more buprenorphine prescriptions than any other state in the country. So we went from nothing to like having all these people being treated. And that kind of continued for a period of time. The second methadone clinic opened in um, Newport and St. Johnsbury, and then one opened in Berlin, and then one opened in Brattleboro, and then one opened in Rutland. So over time, this happened. But the problem was it's a rural state. So if you live in Enosburg Falls at the time, the closest clinic was either Burlington or Newport. That's a good 40 minute ride. And again, you gotta get in the car, gotta go there, gotta get your dose because there were all these laws and restrictions on even getting a take home dose. You get, who, who talked to me about atorvastatin? You get your atorvastatin at the pharmacy for 90 days. You can't get methadone from the clinic for 90 days. The maximum you can get is 28 days. So you're at, at least going every 28 days. And many people have to go every day because up until COVID, there were a lot of laws. If you were still using, if you were smoking cannabis, if you were drinking alcohol, you couldn't get take home. So every day, what a job. There's no other disease in medicine that makes you have to go every day to get your medicine because of some draconian laws that were passed in the 1970s. So in 2011, there was enough buprenorphine being prescribed and there was enough methadone being prescribed where I realized and my colleagues realized that there was this real discrepancy. So some people who were getting this suboxone buprenorphine from their doctor were still struggling, right? They were still maybe using other drugs. Uh, they weren't going for their counseling, they weren't providing urine screens, and so a lot of times doctors would say, we don't really know what to do because we're not trained in addiction. So I thought, okay, I'm a primary care doctor. If I see you in my office today and you're having chest pain, I'm gonna send you to the hospital, you're gonna see a cardiologist, you're gonna get treated, and then when you're done, they'll send you back to me, right? So I thought, okay, if you're a person with opiate use disorder and you're really struggling, you can't stop using, and the doctor doesn't know what to do, why don't we create this system, what we call um, centers of excellence, of addiction excellence, where we would have these different centers throughout the state so that it would be that same exact referral network. So instead of the doctor saying, I don't know what to do, throwing their hands up and not giving it to you anymore, they could say, okay, I'm gonna send you to the hub, 
and you're going to get treated there for a while, and then when you're done, you can come back. So the state adopted in 2013 this model called the hub and spoke model. Anybody hear of it? Okay, so the hub and spoke model is sort of a national model on how to integrate opiate treatment into general medicine because there's no other state that completely integrates the treatment of opiate use disorder into the medical system. So we now have a very robust system to the point where, and that's the point about the, the tip of the iceberg here, is that we currently in Vermont have about 10,000 people, 10,000 Vermonters every day take either methadone or buprenorphine. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you look at the United States data collection, this thing called NISDA, they call 3,000 people around the country and they try to figure out who's got opiate problems, who's got cocaine problems, who's got depression, and they generate this document every year. And NISDA estimates that in Vermont, 1.2% of our adult population, 18 to 64, has an opiate problem. 1.2%, okay? In the United States, 10% of people with opiate use disorder get treated. So that means that theoretically, it would only be 0.12% of Vermonters would be in treatment based on that metric, right? So we got 1.2%, 10% of that is 0.12. I know my math is, I go fast, so I'll, I'll say it again. Let's say in the state of Vermont, they estimate that there's probably 5,000 Vermonters, 4,000 Vermonters that have opiate use disorder based on that number. That would then say that about four to 500 people would be in treatment, okay? Right now, we have 10,000 people in treatment. We have double the number of people that they even estimate have opiate use disorder in the state of Vermont, and that's 20 times the estimate of the number of people that they expect should be in treatment. So we have this large number of people, mainly because of this hub and spoke model. It's the largest number in the United States per capita. 2.4% of our adult population is currently in treatment. There's no other state in the country that comes close to that. The next place in the world that comes close to that is France, where they have 3% of their population. And the next country above that is Iran, who's the top in the world with 5% of their adult populations on either methadone or buprenorphine. So we are way at the top in terms of providing treatment. Why? Because uh, Peter Shumlin, when he was governor, decided to give a State of the Union address, State of the State, about opiate problems and really kind of jump-started this whole hub-and-spoke thing, the amount of money that goes into it, the amount of savings that we see is tremendous. And so what that means is that when we see people who look like they're in trouble, just go to downtown Burlington, go to Brattleboro, go to Rutland, you see people that look like they're in rough shape, that is the tip of the iceberg because there are so many people that are serving you coffee, teaching your kids, driving the, driving your, the truck, all over the state and giving us services that are in treatment that you would have no idea that they're in treatment and they're doing very well. So what happens is that we have this perception. We have this massive drug problem in the state of Vermont when in actuality you're seeing the tiny fraction of people who are not in treatment. Because just like with diabetes, how many people like don't take their metformin or don't take their insulin? There's a whole bunch of them, and I see them in my practice all the time. Like they don't take their blood pressure. And I saw a guy today, his pressure was 190 over 110. Oh, I don't like to take it. Okay, well maybe you should before you have a heart attack. You know, I mean, we see this all the time. And so the fact that we have so many people in treatment, I think should really give people um, some hope that we've made a huge dent in compared to the rest of the country. Now, as to some questions here that are asking about fentanyl. So fentanyl, just to kind of end the, the, the history lesson, has been around for many, many years. And it was developed in a lab. The thing about fentanyl is if you think about this little TV antenna receptor, opiate receptor, we have our naturally occurring endorphin goes in there. We have heroin that goes in there. We have other drugs that go in there. But fentanyl fits very, very deeply into the opiate receptor. So what happens with fentanyl is fentanyl is very powerful, much more powerful than heroin, 50 times more powerful than heroin, 100 times more powerful than morphine. When you go to the hospital and you get fentanyl, it's made in a pharmaceutical lab, and you're getting a tiny little bit of it, it's gonna last 30 to 90 minutes, it's gonna wear off and you're gonna be fine. Because heroin, it's easy to make, you know, I've seen slides of how to make it, you make it in your backyard, if you had morphine, it's not very hard to make. Because it's bulky, uh, 
around the 19, uh, 2017, 2018, we began to see fentanyl making its way into the heroin supply because fentanyl, you need like a pencil tip amount of fentanyl to have the same effect as you do like a tea bag size amount of heroin. So if you're an enterprising cartel, right, wouldn't it be easier to, to smuggle in powder that's a fraction of the amount of heroin? So it began to make its way into the drug supply to the point that probably from 2000, uh, 2020 on during COVID and, and really sort of a border shutdown, we in Vermont never see heroin anymore. Everybody is using what I call jungle fentanyl. So what happens is the cartels get the chemical from China, sometimes from India, sent to Mexico. They get these other precursor chemicals. They put it in a pot in the jungle. They throw these other chemicals. They kind of stir it up, and voila, we have fentanyl. And the purity varies 5 to 30 uh, percent. Nobody really knows. You also probably heard of car fentanyl, which is the stuff they get to elephants to knock them out every now and then, that'll make its way into the supply. And so what happens is that the drug supply is polluted now. There's really toxic waste in Vermont. There's hardly any heroin anymore, which was a pure drug, to the point where now, if you have just a tiny little bit of this drug, the, the, the dealers have to add all this other stuff. It becomes very, very dangerous. And there's also this stuff called xylazine, which is an animal tranquilizer that if you want to put a hippo to sleep, instead of giving a lot of fentanyl, you give xylazine and it kind of sedates them. And so they add xylazine to the drug supply for the sheer reason of prolonging the, the high. So if you have a tiny bit of fentanyl, it's only going to last 30 to 60 minutes, but you add xylazine, people walk around like zombies. They're, they're almost never, they're almost falling over and it's just a prolonged situation. The problem with xylazine that we saw especially last year in Vermont, especially at the hospital, was it causes all these wounds uh, that people develop. So what you see and what you hear in front of you in public, the fentanyl use, the overdose, the xylazine, all that stuff, is again a small fraction of those folks who I think are still quite resistant to being on methadone or buprenorphine because of the hassle of having to go to the clinic. The feds released a lot of the restrictions so we can give a lot more take-homes for methadone, but still, people have to get up every day. And as I say, I can't compete with the Amazon drone delivery of fentanyl to someone's doorstep, right? It's very easy, and so there's a certain willfulness. But the point is that in the fentanyl era, methadone and buprenorphine become uh, more critical than ever because you know, so many people are dying. The news this week is there's been a sudden decrease in the amount of a number of people dying, especially in Vermont, which is good news, but the problem is not going away. The last point I'll make, and then I'll take some questions, is that even though that rate of 2.4% is a statewide average, Franklin County, where I practice twice a week in St. Albans, has 4.5% of their population on methadone or buprenorphine. And the reason for that is because they had some very generous prescribers of opiates for a long time. They had docs that were sort of legendary for writing large scripts, Percocet, oxycodone, morphine, and people became physically dependent. And that is the other way that people become dependent on opiates is they get these pharmaceuticals. And then with the crackdown on prescribing and the pulling back of a lot of opiate prescribing, people had nowhere to turn, and so they go to heroin or they go to fentanyl. And so that's oftentimes 80% of people who are using heroin or fentanyl started with a prescription of pills from somebody like myself, you know, someone with a license to prescribe. So we've, we've dialed that back a little bit. There's a lot fewer opiates being prescribed. There's a lot more treatment. And again, there's so much below the surface that you don't see. I would encourage you to at least be hopeful. Now, there's some concern and questions about what can we do, right? Kids, you see this thing about, you know, teenagers are experimenting. The days of, like, taking some Percocet and sniffing at a party, those are over. There's no more of that stuff around. And so in Texas, they actually had a great public health campaign that said one pill can kill because it's true. Now the cartels, they take the fentanyl, they press it into what looks like an oxycodone. It's got the stamp on it, and people take it thinking it's going to make their back pain better or it's just going to be a pill and they're going to do well. But it's fentanyl, and they don't have any tolerance, and they overdose and die. So that's really the tragedy. And I think part of what my message would be is that, you know, we always like to say don't use, but we really should be educating teenagers and young adults that 
no matter what you think, the pill you're taking is most likely got fentanyl in it, and you use it once, it's not gonna work. Although there's always gonna be a group that says, well, I'm gonna be the one who's not gonna die, right? I'm gonna be the one who jumps off the, the trestle bridge and hit the water, and I'm gonna be fine. So there is that to think about. All right. Something new? Okay. So is this an argument for uh, legalizing uh, opioids? No. I mean, opiates are legal, right? I mean, all the... Making them available, freely available. So if it doesn't hurt the people. So that's an interesting point. So all the prescription opioids are legal, getting a prescription. Yes. However, We'll get provocative for a minute. So there have been some trials done in British Columbia, uh, Switzerland, uh, Zurich, Bern, uh, Munich, where they, and in England, used to provide pharmaceutical heroin. Okay, pharmaceutical heroin is safe. Um, people would use it multiple times a day. And in fact, in Vancouver, in British Columbia, they did about 20 years ago, they tried to clean up the, um, the, the situation where people had no access to water and dirty syringes and all that, so they provided people with you know, needles that were clean, syringes that were clean, uh, water to inject, and then they provided them treatment if they wanted it with either methadone or buprenorphine, but they also had a side study where they would give them pharmaceutical heroin, because they found that there were some people who liked heroin. They didn't like methadone, they didn't like feel. they didn't like buprenorphine, it didn't work, and they, they used heroin, and they used it two or three times a day in a safe consumption site, this was in the early days, and they did fine. They actually were very functional. They went about their day because it's just another opiate. So when we talk about, you know, my argument about the safe consumption site that was passed here recently is it's fine to have a safe consumption site, but you're allowing people to use a toxin. Like they're using tainted fentanyl. In a way, you almost want to provide a safer drug supply yeah. than to allow people to go somewhere and use an unsafe drug supply even though they may, so it's almost like if you went to the liquor store and you bought bathtub gin that was gonna make you blind, they'd sort of figure out how to make it so it didn't make you blind, so you could still have the same effect. So there is an argument that's made around the world of saying, well, this, perhaps we should think about providing a better grade of, of this opium for people to use instead of them relying on whatever's on the street. Because it's not the opiate that's causing the problems, it's the things that are mixed in with the opiate. Yes, and, but also the fentanyl now. I mean, in the, back in the day, heroin was also, things were added to it, but it was a relatively pure product. The, the thing is that most of the time, the fentanyl that people are getting, the purity varies so widely. And so that's where the problem comes from, is nobody really knows if this particular dose is going to do them in or not, because there's no way to test for it. That's a good point. Yeah. Coming. I'm coming. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll start one from Zoom. Can you talk about the step-down unit gap Vermont Digger just reported on and whether there is legislation being drawn up to solve it? The what problem? Step-down step step unit. Oh, okay. So let's talk about treatment for men. So for, in my mind, when you're talking about opiate users, opiate users need a chair, not a bed. Okay. Sending someone to rehab for two weeks does not cure the disease because most of the time when people come out, if they get weaned off of opiates, they're most likely to die two days after they leave treatment. So we know that from jail, as a, just a corollary, in Rhode Island they did a study of five years ago now that they published in JAMA Psychiatry where that if you, were link, if you got started in treatment in jail and you were linked to treatment thereafter, the six month overdose death rate decreased by 68%. So the argument is that if you go somewhere for intensive treatment, that not being on opiate medication when you get out increases your risk for overdose. So in people that are going for opiates primarily, we really like to see them get follow up in fact, there's no, there's no treatment in Vermont right now, except for the one in uh, Bellows Falls, that lets you leave without being on either methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. But in the case of like cocaine or methamphetamine, for which there's no medical treatment, um, or alcohol, there's, there's treatment. There should be some follow-up, but we don't have a step-down. 
kind of thing in the sense that you would go, I mean, there are, there are, there are sober living situations where people go to uh, to support that. We don't have enough sober living in the state of Vermont. Um, but even, you can keep somebody for a year somewhere, but the day they get out of treatment, their brain may be like, I can't wait to use. I mean, we've had people get out of jail after being there for two or three years and overdose three days later because they couldn't wait to get out and use again. Um, so I'm not so sure that the step down thing is something that I understand completely what the person's asking, but in general, the principle would be you want to make sure people are maintained on some kind of medication for their opiate use disorder. I can hear you if you just talk. It sounds like um, the, one of the solutions would be to have more people have access to the Suboxone methadone in collaboration with some services. That, is that true? Yes, and we already have many, many people have that. I think what we're really talking about at this point is the last mile the people at the top of the iceberg who are not in treatment, their challenges are housing, transportation, job, mental illness. And so it's really difficult if you live way out on North Avenue to take three buses for an hour and a half to get to the Chitna Clinic for a five minute intervention and then go back. And so there's, there's lots of things. And in fact, if anybody wants to get involved with a little public advocacy, right now I think GMT is talking about eliminating one of the bus routes to the Chittenden Clinic, uh, which would make it even more difficult for people to get there. So, um, but yeah, we do provide in all the treatment settings, case management, try to help people with all the things that are, are necessary for life, housing, which is practically impossible, at least access to food, access to safe uh, you know, situations, things of that sort. But all the hubs and spokes have staff that can help do that kind of thing. Yeah. And again, 90% of people who are in treatment are working, parenting, or going to school. So it's very successful in terms of helping people get their lives back. Could you talk about um, actual numbers? How many are in the tip of the iceberg? How many are in the rest of the iceberg? And also, what's the trajectory? Is it staying the same, getting worse, getting better? So in Vermont right now, we have, as we speak, about 9,300 people in treatment in either the hubs or the spokes, about 9,300, which is about 2.4% of the 18 to 64 year old population. The estimate in Vermont, because if you take Franklin County, for example, where they have 4.4% of people in treatment, the estimate is that most places in the US probably have between four and 5% of the population has OUD. So if there's 5% of the population, that means there's probably another eight or 9,000 people who are not in treatment. I think that number is a little exaggerated because there are people who come into treatment, leave treatment, come into treatment, leave treatment. So there may be more like 12,000 people in a given year have contact. But there's a certain number of people who, again, it's not worth the trouble. They have, a, they have access to a supply. Maybe someone's sharing their methadone or buprenorphine with them. And, or they don't want to like take the time or they don't have insurance. So, the issue I feel is that we've got basically the coalition of the willing in treatment now and that the next group of people is, I don't know what it really takes to get those people to come back. Because I have people I see and then they leave treatment and then they show up a, a year later and I'm like, thank God you're not dead. But what have you been doing? Oh, I went back to using. So, you know, they kind of cycle in and out of treatment. So um, we still have a certain probably one, one and a half percent of the adult opioid users have never been in treatment, but I would say you probably have hit three, three and a half percent of the four and a half percent who've been in some kind of treatment at some point and chose to drop out and then maybe come back in again. Well, I mean, fortunately, Vermont is um, not backing away from treatment. You know, there are some states who haven't put the effort in, but the legislature keeps funding it. We've got some opioid settlement monies now. Uh, and getting the lock zone out there. I know that in Burlington, we're trying to open up a second clinic back downtown to try to make it more accessible. There's talk about mobile vans driving out into the, the um, different parts of the state. There's a clinic that's gonna open in Bennington, which will make a big difference for people who currently are either going to Brattleboro or Rutland. Um, and now there's an injectable form of buprenorphine that we can give to somebody once a month. So that's a game changer for a lot of people. So they don't have to go to the pharmacy all the time. And 
So, you know, for now, I think if we sort of roll along, um, we probably should see a real decrease in the amount of overdoses that are happening, and hopefully, you know, the drug supply will clean up a little bit and people will just stop getting exposed to xylazine, which is actually the biggest risk right now of all. Hi. Um, where does pure, uncontaminated fentanyl come from for hospitals? Uh, I know it's used in surgeries, et cetera. Yeah, Are they thinking of uh, coming up with a substitute? It's made in, um, it's made in, in Janssen Pharmaceutical, Paul Janssen was the original chemist who, who developed fentanyl. It still comes from um, pharmaceutical, in fact, Myelin up in St. Albans is one of the largest producers of duragesic fentanyl patches in the U.S. So it comes from, it comes from the, the labs. Uh, fentanyl, the thing about fentanyl is that the, uh, the illicit supply of fentanyl rarely makes it to the street. It's the illicit supply that's really the problem. And, um, you know, it, it serves a great purpose. It's a very short-acting opiate. It takes pain away, and, you know, it's gone in 90 minutes. So I don't see that changing at all. In fact, you'd sort of be fearful if they came out with even more and more potent opiates, because then that will somehow find its way into the mainstream. I have known two doctors in my lifetime who have become hooked on drugs. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that that can be corrected? I mean, if I know two doctors that have happened, there must be a lot more. Well, I'm not sure there's a lot more. So it's, it, it's that law of how many people have that kind of brain. Just because you can get into medical school doesn't mean your brain, you can't come be, become dependent on opiates. And sometimes it happens to a, a person who went to the dentist, had an extraction, got some hydrocodone, loved it, and couldn't stop taking it. Or someone who had a surgery and the prescriber kept prescribing it for a period of time. So it can happen even when you didn't think it was going to happen. But again, there are doctors, lawyers, engineers who get stressed out and decide, oh, I'm going to take a little bit of this, I'm going to take a little bit, and the next thing you know, they're, they're, they're in trouble also. So I think it's just the law of averages, uh, and I've known a few, but I wouldn't say it's widespread, fortunately. Uh, and the other thing about being a physician is that you cannot practice medicine anywhere in the United States and be on methadone or buprenorphine. You cannot be. You can only be on this drug naltrexone, and so for a lot of people, that's a pretty heavy uh, uh, lift because the drug doesn't work that well, so it's it's problematic. But yeah, there you know, and then you have the ability to write prescriptions. They're forging prescriptions, all that stuff. But it's 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 much more likely to be alcohol than it is to be opiates in terms of what docs get in trouble with. Yeah. Um, you've talked mostly about people who are using these drugs to combat anxiety or pain. What about recreational use? How much of the people that you're talking about are young people or adults who do it just for fun? Right, so I think... And also I want to ask about yeah. cocaine, how that fits into the picture. Okay, so most people who start using opiates don't necessarily do it because they're in pain. They do it sometimes recreationally. You know, the friend, teenager, my friends were using, I decided to use, I was getting high for a bit, for a bit and then it was, you know. And so that is actually probably the more common reason if you look at, and if you look at opioids that are not prescribed, 70% of opiates that people use come from family and friends. So there's a certain percentage that get them from physicians, but a great number of people that get them from friends and family, and they might, again, do it recreationally and then become dependent. So it's maybe a 50-50, maybe a 60-40, but recreational use is oftentimes the main entry point in. Cocaine, uh, yeah, Vermont's, you know, cocaine use rate has always been about 10 to 12 percent in our drug using population we see. Um, there's no medicine you can give somebody who's cocaine dependent. In fact, uh, heroin was supposed to be a um, cure for a morphine addiction, and then cocaine was thought to be a cure for morphine addiction back in the 1880s. But um, it's, it's a problem. In fact, it's being tainted with fentanyl now. So some of the overdose deaths that have happened in the United States have happened because people are using powdered cocaine that's been laced with fentanyl, and they overdose and die because they have no tolerance to it. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep.